I'm delighted to be here on behalf of ePortfolio Ireland and we're all going to take a turn at sharing a little bit of our story about creating the IGA TEL special issue on ePortfolio which came out over the last number of months. So just to explain a little bit about ePortfolio Ireland. So what you're seeing on screen is myself, Orna, Karen and Tom and our newest member, Laura Costello from MIC has also joined. We are the steering committee of ePortfolio Ireland and all our details are there. <laughs> Orna's making me talk fast, which is probably not a bad thing. Um, all our details to connect with us are there on screen. We're on Twitter. We have our website. But effectively, we're a professional learning network for ePortfolio practitioners and researchers. Go, Orna. Uh, so over the last number of years, we were founded back in 2017 as Mahara IRL as a small group within DCU. Um, we rebranded in 2018 and became ePortfolio Ireland to support a broader range of uh, pr practitioners as well as platforms in the ePortfolio space. So we've had many, many professional development uh, events, faced lots face-to-face pre-COVID. Unfortunately, we've been online since obviously. Um, but we've had on conferences, we've had webinars um, and many other sessions. So if you want to just skip on there, Orna, um, what I just wanted to say is we also have developed as part of this community collaborative resources. And that first one on the left, that ePortfolio based assessment ebook is um, a suite of exemplars of how uh, ePortfolio based assessment is being used uh, across the country and in fact internationally as well across the, the UK. Um, that was a product of our ePortfolio on conference back in 2018. Um, now, what we've done and what we'll be launching today at three o'clock in a later session is the newest um, resource to, to, to join our family. And that is looking at the diversity of ePortfolio practice uh, from an international perspective. So we have partnered with ABLE in the US, which is our uh, equivalent international professional development body for uh, ePortfolio. We are launching the newest book at three o'clock today. Um, but one of the other things which now leads straight into the next section of this presentation is one of the other things that we did as part of ePortfolio Ireland was to run a national survey of ePortfolio practice. And um, that's certainly formed one of the um, articles that takes uh, its place with the um, rest of the journal that the, I'm not sure if Tom has made it yet, but that Orna and, um, oh my God, Karen are going to, Karen, <laughs> block. Orna and Karen are going to talk to you about. So that's my piece over and dusted. Uh, I will pass on now. The reason we decided to collaborate with the Irish Journal of Technology Enhanced Learning and create a special issue on, on ePortfolio is essentially like the, the community of ePortfolio Ireland was growing. People were interested. Um, but really, there was very little research on ePortfolio in an Irish context. Um, so we were trying to fill this gap. They were the kind of motivations. We had the idea quite a long while ago, it seems. You can see here in May 2020, we launched the call. I think we had a soft launch a bit earlier, um, but I suppose COVID really stretched out the timeline. I mean, we had, we had ideas about completing this in a much shorter time frame, but as you can see there by the process, it turned out to be quite long. So we launched the call in May. Uh, we then had an information webinar in June. We had a lot of interest. Um, we put in place a lot of kind of writing supports because at that information webinar, you know, people, you know, told us that, for example, you know, they were new to research. They've never written an article before. Um, so we decided to take a very supportive approach. And in July 2020, we had a Pomodoro writing workshop, which Tom led uh, to support the writing of abstracts. So authors, um, first of all, submitted an abstract in August 2020. Uh, this is kind of a long abstract, but we got 20, which was excellent. So you can see <laughs> the big gap is here. Uh, so, you know, we were we were we were we were we were. We were going well during the summer, but then the submission, review, feedback, edits, copy editing took ages. Uh, no, 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 
no point in lying about that. A lot of it was COVID related. I mean, everyone's workload just went insane, authors and editors. But we managed to get it together. And in December 2021, 20, we published the final full issue. We published uh, five articles early in July, and then we published the rest in December. So it's 15 in total. This was the call we put together. Um, really, we were interested in case studies of e-portfolio practice at any level. Uh, people uh, using, you know, exploring different uses, extracurricular placements, so new types of approaches. One of the articles has in the issue has is about apprenticeships, which is very interesting. That's different. There was a strong professional learning element as well. Um, and at the same time, when we were kind of thinking about the call and discussing it with the editors in the IJTEL. Um, Will I take over here, Orna? Oh, sorry, Karen. No, Indeed, you're fine. you should. Moving swiftly towards the FemEd Tech call, um, as Orna was just about to say, we, we wanted to respond to the FemEd Tech open letter to editors and editorial boards, which really was denouncing the disproportionate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on women researchers and women scholars. And of course, since then, further accounts have emerged on the impact of the pandemic and related lockdowns and restrictions on women researchers, but specifically where women in academia were publishing fewer journal articles or publishing fewer scholarly outputs than they were before the emergency was announced in January 2020. Um, so this call, I suppose, has, has tried to respond to the significant impact um, on women scholars uh, partly due to domestic caring responsibilities associated with school and child care closures. Um, it's well documented by Hush and others that women academics were disproportionately responsible for child care, for household duties, and more likely women were, um, more likely women were, I suppose, expected to be in dual care relationships with other academics and have more service and teaching responsibilities in higher ed. On to the next slide. Um, this is where we wanted to, I suppose, respond effectively to the Fem Ed Tech call. Um, because really what we were asked as journal editors was to consider the issues while reviewing submissions, while preparing calls, um, and really to take some special measures to support women researchers and women scholars at the time. We were also encouraged to promote gender balance by inviting potential authors to submit papers written by both uh, women and men authors and prioritise papers written by women specifically, particularly where they're single or they're lead authors. Um, what we tried to do um, was to take into account appropriate empathetic timescales, which were flexible and took into consideration um, the additional responsibilities that were placed on, on some women during the pandemic. Um, we really wanted to try and help mitigate these effects on women scholars. Um, and as Orna mentioned earlier, we wanted to provide flexible deadlines and submission, supported online writing sessions, developmental feedback opportunities. And ultimately, as a result of the special issue, which we'll explain a little bit later, we, I suppose, received submissions from 29 authors, of which 24 were women and five were men, and 97% of our first authors were female. It's worth sharing, I think, um, a personal perspective, which was alluded by Orna earlier with that, that gap in activity that happened between 20 and 21. And certainly from, from my personal perspective as a co-editor, while I was greatly supported by colleagues, I certainly found it difficult to balance the demands of university work and personal responsibilities. This, of course, directly relates to the personal or to the intensification of workload, as mentioned by Catherine and by Mark earlier. Um, and our timelines were flexible to accommodate and support our authors. And as a team, we certainly mirrored that flexibility and support to provide space uh, to each other. Of course, um, all aspects of the pandemic will persist for some time at least. I mean, many are, are still remote working for some caring responsibilities and social mobility restrictions are still in place. Um, but really, I suppose we recognised as an editorial team that these burdens were experienced by our colleagues, our peers and our students. So we really wanted to take the opportunity in 2020 and 2021 to publish scholarly work with this evolving new normal that re-emphasises the need, particularly for those in power, to actively and continually seek to raise our awareness of potential and actual inadequate, inadequate outcomes, um, and particularly in response to the gender equity issue that was highlighted by the FemEd Tech open letter. And ultimately, we had hoped to act, lead and move forward with care and empathy um, for scholars in this space. I'll let you take over, Orna. Thanks, Karen. 
Um, so here is the special issue. Uh, we'll pop the link in the chat in a second. Um, so I, we've, we've said some of this already, so I won't I won't cover old ground, but essentially 58 articles, 12 about Ireland and three from further afield. It was initially called ePortfolio in Ireland, but then we got some interesting international submissions, so we changed it slightly. Um, key themes, professional learning came out very strongly, reflective practice, creativity, apprenticeships, two national studies, one from ourselves and ePortfolio Ireland. So we have a, a, an article about um, our national study of ePortfolio practice in Ireland. And then also colleagues in Canada conducted quite a similar one, different methodology, but all, you know, interesting to have the two side by side. And then we had some good, I think this shows an evolution of, of the research in Ireland, that we had some discipline, very discipline oriented uh, pieces as well. So business studies, there was a couple of really good ones there. And then we also had one about social justice, one about geography. So, it, you know, once it's becoming embedded in the discipline, I think that's, you know, a sign of progress. Uh, Karen has said most of this already, so I'm not going to cover all ground, but, you know, we're, we're really pleased that 97% of the first authors are female, but I suppose in a way we've, we've skewed the gender balance in a different direction, uh, and 83% are, are, are women. So lessons learned. Uh, I might call on my, my co-editors uh, to come in on this, but, but, but in terms of some lessons learned... Uh, that I think I've mentioned this, this pandemic just just wrecked everything in terms of timelines for both authors and editors. Um, many of us are involved in supporting teaching and learning and, 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 and directly teaching students as well. Uh, and the pivot online just it, it just the workload involved huge. Um, the review and editing process is very time consuming. This is a lesson learned. I mean, all of us have been involved in publication and journals and stuff before that. But I, uh, not not this level of detail. So, it, it, you know, it was a surprise to us how much work is involved and how many people are involved. Uh, and we really couldn't have done it without the support of the IJTEL editorial team. So uh, Fiona Concanon, Eamon, Costello and Tom, um, we really benefited from their experience of using the journal, the journal system. The OJS system is a bit tricky. Um, and just their experience of having published uh, many issues of the journal before. So I might just call on Lisa, Karen, Tom, any any other lessons learned to contribute there? No, I think I'd just echo what you said there, Orna. I mean, pandemic times are hard for everybody and we certainly had the same challenges um, that everybody else did when they were trying to um, pull together and ultimately write the articles that featured in the journal. And we equally had time challenges and, and workload challenges to, to edit. And just to give full credit to Orna, who absolutely took the lead on that. Um, so, uh, no, uh, Tom, I know you haven't had a chance because you- Sorry, you Tom, I had to do it. your slides. Oh, uh, no, 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 he's done a great job. No, I think the only thing that the polls was, uh, and I, I, I'd like to echo what Lisa said about, about uh, you know, the driving energy and the dynamo. If people think that uh, I, I'm a fairly enthusiastic person, you, you want to work with Anna Farrell, she's, uh, she, does, she does the plan, uh, it's a huge, uh, a huge honour, but uh, but I also I think Fiona can handle as well. You know, uh, just want to echo, she, she, she's absolutely brilliant with the system and definitely a huge group of us. Um, I suppose one thing though, um, in terms of just doing special issues, um, everything was submitted into um, the OJS system, and we also allowed people to to submit to start their sort of abstracts, so we could start that process of developing. I think things got a little bit sort of mixed up at that stage. There, we needed maybe a, a separate uh, portal just for the abstracts, and then for the the, the actual issues, and maybe just where the Marielta editors had. Uh, you know, if we have some way of sort of separating, we're going to do a special issue and you're also going to take in regular submissions. But, you know, look, I think everybody pulled that, you know, pulled, it, pulled it together and pulled hard for that. So I thought it was, it, it, it was great. And, and they're really, look, you can't overestimate how, how difficult the last year is. So you try throwing in, um, looking for the viewers, getting people to write and stuff. And uh, so, yeah, I'm sure that, uh, Okay, 
thanks for that uh, very stimulating presentation, everyone. Um, we, I, I know we're way behind time, but I, I think uh, these presenters, having been disrupted, deserve a few minutes for questions. So if there's any questions, uh, put, uh, turn on your mic and ask the question or pop it in the chat area. Catherine, I think you have a question. It's a comment and a question. So um, the comment was at a we found similarly in UCC it was just so difficult to 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 get the time and the headspace. But we actually had this um, in person turn up and write sessions that we used to run for our staff and do and attend ourselves. So we, we run things for staff that we want for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I found that that actually translated well into the digital because um, there's something about knowing someone's on the other end of a team's call writing <laughs> that kind of holds you to account. Um, but then my, my question was, do, do you notice kind of a, um, a major impact in terms of navigating ethics? We had a massive backlog in our <coughs> team and it really hampered some research. Not really, actually. Um well certainly in dcu where we our committee just kept meeting like every month but but i don't know if i didn't come up from other authors i don't know anyone else i certainly remember at the initial review stage and maybe this was the abstract review stage there was a couple of question marks around some um ethical issues that we observed but again because of our stretched timelines catherine it gave i guess the authors the opportunity to provide us with the clarity or, or ethical approval that we requested so i think because we didn't see a huge amount of, of ethical, um, I suppose, struggle because we actually had those extended timelines for writing. So, so maybe it was just time was on our side for once. <laughs> so we made it very clear at the, uh, and I think, I, I think the session is far more politely encouraged. I think we call it short open right? So maybe and we were very clear that. Uh, so I think that that long timeline it wasn't an issue. Can I can I just ask a question here that's less about the research aspect of this, but it's, it's more about the portfolios and the practicalities of uh, academics implementing e-portfolios. Is there a sort of a, a set of a sort of guidelines for or the dummies guide to um, uh, uh, implementing e-portfolio? for uh, academics that are short of time in other words what's the minimalistic uh what's the minimal you require to implement a portfolio with your students is there does this exist uh, um... can, can i jump in there brian um i suppose we've we've a number of resources that may be useful in that space and um, that first ebook certainly has guidelines around how to successfully implement uh, e-portfolio. Now, there's a lot of work, obviously, that needs to go foregrounding that, you know, choosing, looking at platforms, looking at the, the purposes of the e-portfolio and, and, and why it's being implemented. But um, once a decision has been made to go ahead and use e-portfolio, which, of course, we're advocates and we do think that it's a really authentic, holistic method of assessment for students and we absolutely advocate their use. Um, but in that first ebook, um, which I'll pop the link into the chat now if it's not already there, there is guidelines within there. Um, and also within the DCU ebook, all of these ebooks as resources are up on the ePortfolio Ireland website. So to some extent, there's two levels there. There's one for the institution to choose an e-portfolio. So, yes. uh, and to some extent, a dummy's guide may not be appropriate there because you need to yeah. do a fairly good job of doing it. But uh, once the um, it has been chosen and it's available to academics, uh, those academics may need a sort of a dummy's guide uh, to implement that particular e-portfolio that's available to them, which would include general advice on use of e-portfolios that would be applicable to everybody, plus some specific advice on the particular tool that's been used in their institution. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So those that's what I'm looking really for. I'm looking for that dummy's guide. <laughs> <laughs> and there's loads of use cases. Um, those e-books are, are effectively a, exemplars of uh, e-portfolio practice across a range of disciplines, undergraduate, postgraduate, um, different platforms. So it, it gives a really good insight in how other people are using it, which the plan was to inspire others to, to, to adopt. So 